Chapter 19, Act 19, The King's Tale Act 19, The King's Tale The Estranged The second bandit peered over the bridge, hands on his hips as he spat in disgust. Oh, great. We could have eaten like kings tonight if we got everything he had on him. The first bandit held up his hands defensively, shaking his head. I, I didn't do anything. He just jumped right in. You saw it. Oop. Edward moaned and lifted his waterlogged head, coughing up what felt like gallons of water before collapsing back down on the slippery, rocky cavern floor to gasp for air. Something warm was trickling from his nose, when it reached his lips, he realized it had the same brackish taste of blood, and swiped his wrist across his mouth to smear it away. Where am I? He summoned the strength to open his eyes, and was greeted by a miraculous spill of sunlight only yards away. Rather than the roar of the waterfall that had been pounding his eardrums before he lost consciousness, he could now only hear the gentle lapping of water, and the distant echo of creaking wood. Slowly, meticulously, he pulled himself up to his hands and knees, coughing yet again and feeling his stomach roll threateningly. He turned his head to the side just in time to vomit into a puddle of water that had been steadily filling from the dripping cavern ceiling, narrowly avoiding making himself even more of a mess. He gasped in relief as soon as the last of the sickness left his body, clutching his concave abdomen. Get up. Harley's waiting. When the clenching pain in his stomach had passed, he next climbed to his feet, his hands immediately flying to his hips and feeling for the potion bottle that contained the sand pearl. Marvelously, it remained unscathed with only an inch or so of water having made its way inside. The rest of the bottles on his belt had shattered and disappeared, and he realized with a pang of despondency that his harp was gone as well. No matter. What's most important is still here. As Edward had drifted between consciousness and oblivion, his mind awash with visions that he couldn't tell were memories, delusions, or a bizarre mixture of both, he had sworn that he could feel warm and familiar arms wrapped around his waist as he was tossed about, and a quiet, soothing voice whispering in his ear above the water's roar that everything would be okay. Had that same phantasm protected the sand pearl? Anna? Were you trying to help me one last time? The low footbridge that he spotted to his right seemed terribly familiar. He scrambled up the shoreline, heaving himself up onto the bridge with much effort, being that his clothes felt as if they weighed several tons. He gazed out toward the sunlight that was teasingly dancing around the outline of the chamber's exit, his heart swelling with happiness. The waterfall must be e sent me all the way through the caverns, and the exit's straight ahead. Please hang on, Harley. Making his way west back to Capo, Edward made note of the twin moons that had made an early appearance in the daytime sky even as the sun lingered in the western horizon. He could swear that the new arrival satellite was yet bigger than when they had left Damsion, and Edward feared that he had either been knocked out for days, or that it had taken little time for the moon to grow in size exponentially. Neither situation was very good, and spurred Edward to run faster, despite the protesting spasms of his exhausted, battered body. Upon reaching the village gates, Edward pushed past a gaggle of girls and women who were gathered around a long, flat riser that was being erected near the southern point of the village, catching snippets of their conversation as he apologetically elbowed them out of the way. So excited for the festival tonight. I'm glad they didn't cancel it. I wish King Edward was playing, don't you? The minstrel they got is okay, but... Bursting through Nick and Mayaka's door, Edward pounded up the stairs and found everyone, including his guards, crowded in Harley's room and talking quietly among themselves. Nick jumped from his chair when he spotted Edward, his eyes immediately darting to the bottle Edward had torn from his belt on his way up the stairs. You've got the sand pearl. Quickly, shine its light on her. Nick exclaimed, and Mayaka shooed the guards out of the way so that Edward could approach the bed. Harley was twisted in the sheets, her cheeks sunken and her face and lips as white as the moon's outside. Someone had made the effort to brush out her hair, which hung limply over her shoulders and over the sides of the bed, the tendrils soaked in sweat. Harley! Edward gasped, his hands shaking uncontrollably as he turned the bottle over and deposited the sand pearl in his palm. Holding it inches above her face, the room began to fill with a warm, gentle glow, a pearlescent sheen washing over Harley's features as she grimaced and let out a strangled cry. Moments later, the sand pearl crumbled into dust, and Edward turned his palm, letting it sprinkle over her lips and chest. Ung. Ugh. 
Harley gasped, and Mayako leaned in, hesitantly tipping a carafe of water to her lips. But this time, instead of watching it spill, wasted, onto herself, Harley's mouth pressed eagerly against the glass, and her throat muscles flexing as she swallowed. Edward pressed his hand over his mouth, feeling his pulse palpitate through his fingers. Reaching up and weakly pushing the carafe away, Harley turned to Edward, her eyelids fluttering as she locked her gaze onto his. Your Highness! Edward broke into a smile, shaking his head. Harley! Thank goodness I made it in time! Harley let out a frustrated sigh as she reached up, pushing her hair out of her eyes and pressing her palm to her cheek. My deepest apologies! This is all my fault! If only I hadn't pushed myself beyond my limits! I guess I'm not as young as I used to be, hey? She smiled crookedly, her eyes watering as her fingers distractedly felt over her face for her glasses. Did I ruin our chances to get to Baron? I know how badly you wanted to speak with Cecil. No, Harley, Edward bit his lip, reaching for her glasses that were tucked away safely on the nightstand next to the bed, leaning in to delicately slide them back onto her face. She gazed up at him, blinking the tears from her lashes as he marveled at his reflection in her dilated eyes. He hardly recognized the person staring back at him, and for once, that was a good feeling. You did. Nothing wrong. I realized. His voice suddenly trailed off as his eyes closed without warning, falling forward and collapsing into Harley's lap with a loud crash. Harley shrieked, pressing her hands to her mouth in horror. Why your highness? Welcome home, your highness. How was the wedding? Everything was as perfect as it could be, Edward smiled, shrugging off his traveling cloak and letting a yawn escape. The Chancellor waited anxiously for more details as Edward drifted about the throne room that was still under a myriad of construction, a moony grin on his face. Rosa was a breathtaking bride, and Cecil. Well, I can tell he is going to be one of the finest kings to ever grace Baron's throne. I'm rather jealous of his subjects, to be honest. My lord, may I remind you that you're a king yourself? The Chancellor sighed, and Edward waved his hand, laughing. It's good for me to have a vision to live up to, is all I am saying. Is that better? Not entirely, no. Cecil, er, King Cecil, is four years younger than you and has nary a fraction of your pedigree. You should at least take a little pride in your lineage, my lord. Edward paused, shaking his head. Not that he agreed with the Chancellor anyway, but if he had heard what Edward had learned about Cecil's real lineage, he wondered if he would have still made such a comment. The thought of the look on the Chancellor's face if he found out that the newest king of Baron was not only a non-royal, but was also only half-human and shared his genes with the force that had just tried to destroy their planet, was deliciously tempting. But alas, it was not Edward's secret to ever share, which he was perfectly content with. Ah, where we come from is no matter. It's who we become that matters most. Speaking of such, is Harley still here? No, your highness. She was sorry to have to miss you, but her ship left just a few hours before your return. Oh, Edward frowned. That's too bad. I rather enjoyed talking with her before I had to go to Baron. So, what did you think of her? Do you think she would make a good assistant for the rebuild? The Chancellor tilted his head. What did you think of her, Your Highness? Edward sank into his throne, gazing up at the nighttime sky that could still be seen through the incomplete throne room roofing. The late summer air was so delightfully still and free of the usual sticky humidity that plagued Damsai in this time of year, he was tempted to make camp under the stars that night. He had been so exhausted from dancing, laughing and toasting with all of his friends, that he could have fallen asleep standing up right then and there. How could he have possibly doubted going to the coronation? It had been one of the happiest days of his life, his new life, as he had come to think of it, despite the underlying sadness that still clawed at him deep inside. But still. He had also been anxious to get back home and speak with Harley again, there had been something about her energy that just made him come alive, made him think about things differently when she talked about them versus anyone else. He thought part of it came from her rigorous academic background, she was first and foremost a scholar, and approached everything from a rationalistic perspective that was foreign to the upbringing one received when they were being groomed for the throne. But then she would surprise him with a surprisingly tender commentary about the state of the world in the aftermath of the war or the role empathy would play in rebuilding a nation, and he would have to go back to the drawing board in terms of figuring out just who he was dealing with. Edward closed his eyes. Quite frankly, she's brilliant. A breath of fresh air that could really elevate Damsion's position in the world in the next ten years, if she were to apply herself to more than just the reconstruction project. 
Being a citizen of Troya, I think I better understand where her pacifist principles originate. Yet, there is still something about her that feels very familiar, isn't there? I think the people of Damsion would take to her. The Chancellor pressed his lips together. I agree with you, Your Highness. She was very helpful while you were out, I'm anxious to show you the abundant progress that was made in your short time away, after you have recovered from your journey. But before we get carried away, I do think some due diligence is in order. She was not keen to share much of her background with either of us, we should prepare a dossier before any final decisions are made. Edward raised his eyebrows. You really think so? That could take weeks, we could really use her help as soon as possible. The Chancellor nodded. I'm sorry, Your Highness, call it the paranoia of an old man who has seen too much in these past few troubling months. I have no reason to doubt your judgment of Miss Harley, and it was my hope as well that she could perhaps elevate beyond a standard assistant, that role seems too narrow for someone like her. However, all things considered, I think it would be for the best. Very well, Edward sighed. But, let me do it, okay? You can certainly review my efforts before any final decisions are made. The Chancellor nodded. As you wish, my lord. Harley. When I found out where you were from and how your parents had died, I suddenly understood why I felt like you were so familiar to me. It was the strangest feeling, my soul knew everything about your agony as soon as I read your letter, and it was my mind that needed to catch up, only to confirm what I had known the entire time. I've told myself that I couldn't prevent what happened that day to maintain a semblance of peace. But deep inside, you always wonder if that's really true. If I had been a better prince, would I have picked up on anything amiss? If I had spent less time running away and drowning myself in my music and the thrills of first love, would I have seen the signs of Baron's corruption earlier? But I think the difference between the me of 17 years ago and the me now is not my title, but that I've realized I've grown stronger with you. If it's true that this new moon means we're doomed to repeat the past, as much as I fear it, I finally feel like I can change the tides of fate. If you're there to help me. Forgive me for my selfishness. I only realized it when you fell ill. I need you by my side yet a little while longer. I think he's coming to. NNNGH. Edward's eyes fluttered open, and he was surprised to find himself staring up into an unfamiliar thatched ceiling. His dream, or rather, his memory, of being back in Damsion after Cecil's wedding had seemed so real that he could practically feel the starlight dancing on his skin. Leaning over him, her white fingers clasped together, was Harley. Her hair had been swept back into its usual bun, and her face was clear of flush and shadow, she looked like her old self again. Your Highness. You're awake. Behind her, Nick clicked his tongue. Luckily, this doesn't look like a case of desert fever to me. Just exhaustion. You were only out for a little while, I think your whole company just needs to learn what sleep is and start, you know. Doing it? Edward blushed, shaking his head. Now it's my turn, is it? I apologize for worrying you. Harley crossed her arms, huffing. You've gone halfway around the world for me, my lord. Why did you put yourself through this? Nick turned to her, raising his eyebrows. You're the one who's pushing herself too hard here, Harley. You've just recovered from illness yourself and yet here you are, refusing to leave his side. You should still be in bed too. What? Edward blinked, and Harley blushed furiously, stabbing a finger into Nick's chest. You promised me you wouldn't tell him. Honestly. Is this any way to treat a former schoolmate? Edward lowered his head, trying to hide the grin that was exploding onto his face. Harley, you didn't have to do that. Harley whirled around, pressing her hand to her mouth, her eyes wide. Oh of course I did. You brought me the sand pearl, and... Er, I mean, it is my duty as your secretary, my lord. That's all there is to it. Edward laughed, feeling the blush in his cheeks crawl into his neck. Thank you, Harley. I truly mean it. 
Your Highness, Amy stepped forward, giving a slight bow. I don't want to rush anyone, but I felt you and Lady Harley should know that the next ship to Baron is due to leave tonight. I did some reconnaissance at the docks today while Toby and Joe stayed with Harley, and the sailors did not have kind things to say about their time in Baron, they were on the ship we were supposed to catch last night. It sounds like something odd is happening there, and they have been anxious to leave the country nearly as soon as they dock. I fear if we don't catch this ship, there may not be another opportunity for us in a long while, they are looking for excuses not to return. Is it truly only the same day that I left to get the sand pearl? Edward asked confusedly, and Amy nodded. Yes, sir. Specifically, it's been two days since the moon's return. It sounds like you have been through quite the ordeal if you thought otherwise. Edward shook his head. I had no idea how long I was out in the waterway. But I suppose bumbling along in the river made my journey through quite efficient. It's just a shame I don't remember any of it. My lord. Harley blanched. No wonder you passed out. You were half drowned. But never mind that. Edward smiled. I'm okay now, and Amy's right. This might be our last chance to get to Baron, we must seize the opportunity. Are you sure you have to go so soon? Mayaka frowned. The Capo Flower Festival is tonight, you don't have to go crazy, but a little fun might be what the doctor ordered after what you two have been through. There will be music and good food, everyone loves it. I'm sorry. We really must be going, Harley said softly. But someday. I think I might like to come back for the festival. It's been nearly two decades. Maybe it's time to make some new, good memories here. I'll take you, someday, Edward thought as he watched Harley's eyes water before she turned away, discreetly raising her sleeve to banish her tears. It's time for me to make some new memories as well. Oh, your highness, do not forget these, Joe piped up, raising the bouquet of flowers in her arms that Edward had left behind at the inn. You still wanted to give this to King Cecil, right? Oh my! Very thoughtful, and fitting for the flower festival. Mayaka smiled. You know, Nick's grandparents once hosted King Cecil and Queen Rosa in this very house during their travels, long before they became king and queen. Isn't that a cute coincidence? Edward found himself gazing out of the lone window in the bedroom, catching a glance at the twin moons hanging ominously in the rapidly darkening sky. I'm not sure if coincidence is the right word. On the way to the docks, Edward caught the group up on his travels up north. When he had finished, all Harley could do was shake her head in dismay. All of that, and you lost your harp as well? My debt to you grows ever larger, my liege. It sounds like His Highness got what he wanted out of it, Toby winked. Right. Precisely, Edward smiled. A harp and the memories throttled out of my brain from the river's thrashing can be replaced. You, Harley, simply cannot. Goodness, Harley flushed, hiding her face. Did you hit your head as well? As they approached the last remaining ship in the eastern harbor, the captain bounded down the gangplank, waving. King Edward! You headed for Baron? You've just made it with only seconds to spare, if so. Yes, Edward nodded. Thank you for accommodating us. It's not a problem your highness, the captain nodded toward Amy. Your guard told me everything earlier, we tried to hold off as long as we possibly could. Come on aboard, and make yourselves comfortable. He turned toward the ship, where a few sailors were scrambling about making last-minute checks. Prepare to raise anchor, men. Off we go. Aye aye, sir. With the darkness of the evening quickly ascending upon them, Edward had gone down into the captain's quarters to obtain a lantern. He had noticed that Harley was furiously scribbling in her notebook, and figured she needed some light to write by. He knew if he let her keep at it, she would be squinting so hard that she would eventually exhaust herself and complain of a headache the next morning. When he returned to the deck, oil lamp in hand, he sat on the crate next to Harley, raising the lantern over her head. How are you feeling? Harley lifted her eyes, looking up at him as she rested the nib of her pen against the fresh page she had just started. Jay just fine, my lord. But what about you? Edward smiled, gazing into the soft yellow glow of the lamp. A beautiful yellow gown, drifting over the waves of the moonlight-streaked lake. Perhaps for the last time. I could hardly feel healthier right now. Indeed, healthier than I've been in many years. Harley blinked. Sir. 
Edward shook his head. Oh, sorry. Just reminiscing about the past a little. Harley turned back to her notebook, biting her lip. I see. She glanced up at the sky, her pen starting to move, Edward saw that she was sketching the twin moons. Is something the matter? Edward asked, and Harley didn't reply for a few moments while she completed her sketch. Her pen moved underneath the orbs, where she seemed to hesitate in writing anything further. Finally, she set the pen down in the spine of the notebook, and looked back at Edward. Your Highness! What do you think about that moon? Edward pursed his lips together as he lifted his gaze to the skies above. The sea breeze was as volatile as ever, suddenly blowing a spray of water upon the deck, of which Edward took the brunt of for the two of them. But despite the growing chill, he didn't even flinch, he was transfixed by the heavens. Is that really that same moon? The same moon from before? The Lunarians. Golbez! Harley muttered, and Edward was shaken from his trance. When he looked back down at her notebook, she saw the familiar name scrawled beneath the smaller moon. Harley bit her lip, underlining his name three times. The sorcerer in black armor. The one who once took Baron hostage and used it to take the crystals. In the end, he left the planet, along with his moon. You know about that? Edward gasped, and Harley raised an eyebrow. So it is true. Edward pressed his lips together, and Harley shrugged. Please don't seem so surprised. I simply conducted a little research of my own. It was a little too coincidental that the man who had wreaked havoc throughout the planet suddenly disappeared along with an entire moon. Edward could only snort, of course she had figured it out. How much more do you know? I know of certain theories regarding magic and airships. Claiming they were gifts from the moon, not discoveries made by people here. And that perhaps some of the moon's descendants walk among us even now. She scrawled one more name in her notebook under Golbez's, and Edward leaned over her shoulder. Cecil. Edward let out a quiet sigh. Impressive. Harley chewed on the end of the pen thoughtfully. But this moon. It looks different to my eyes. It is not the same one as before. Not the one I remember seeing in the past. Finally, she slammed the notebook shut, and Edward stood up stretching as the lantern gently swung in his hands on its handle, making their shadows dance across the deck. I must agree. Captain! Fabulian ship off our port side! There came a shout from one of the sailors, and both Edward and Harley looked up in surprise, staring at each other. Ha ha! The captain bellowed from the steering wheel. Let's show em what we got, my lads. I haven't seen Captain Carter in a dog's age. Time to show him who has the faster ship. Aye aye, sir. The sailors chanted, and they heard another sail unfurling above them. Fabble! Edward blinked, approaching the railing with the lantern raised. Harley stood up to follow him, tucking her hair behind her ears as another piercing gust of wind blew. Is that... Yang! Edward gasped, pushing his wavy hair out of his face and tugging his scarf further down from his mouth. Harley raised her eyebrows and pushed her glasses further up her nose to get a better look at the ship that had come into view. As in the King of Fabol. In the glow of the lantern, she could see someone that did greatly resemble King Yang, a large, imposing figure that could crudely be described as layers of muscles that had their own muscles, who had a long blonde whippet of a ponytail that reached past his waist, set in a thick rope-like braid. He was accompanied by a young girl with blonde, bushy pigtails who could only be Princess Ursula, and a group of monks. Glancing back at their own company of guards, Harley bit her lip. Edward nodded excitedly. Yes. You could not find a stronger or gentler monarch. Nor one half so brave. It's been ages since we last spoke. Yang shouted across the sea, his hands cupped over his mouth. Edward. Are you sailing for Baron as well? Yes, that's right. Edward exclaimed. Harley looked at Edward, her palms suddenly sweating against the ship's railing. Their destination is the same as ours. She blinked. Edward turned to face her. Indeed. Fabul has picked up on the same signs we have, no doubt. Ah, what a shot of confidence, knowing that he's on our side. So something must be afoot in Baron after all. Harley trailed off. What will King Cecil do if both Edward and Yang approach him? This could turn dangerous very quickly. Will he perceive it as an attack? 
What signs did Papal pick up on? Did the Red Wings visit them as well about the meteor? Suddenly, their ship seemed to surge ahead, in the blink of an eye, Yang, and Asila's ship was swallowed into the darkness. Harley and Edward ran toward the rear of the ship, trying to see what was going on, but it was no good, the Fabulian ship had completely disappeared from sight. Master Yang's ship is falling behind, Harley frowned. What happened to them? Could there be some trouble on board? Edward suddenly shivered, closing his eyes and clenching his jaw. Ugh! What's wrong, my lord? Harley reached up, gently resting her fingers over his plate armor, which was covered in a spray of water. Are you cold? Edward opened his eyes, shaking his head slowly. Still, he refused to look at her. No. I'm all right. Just remembered something else from a long time ago. Much later that night, Edward awoke to a chorus of garbled shouting and the sound of freight being dropped in thundering crashes that made him nearly fall out of bed. He heard someone stirring in the bed in the next corner over, and when he pried open his eyes, he saw Harley standing on her toes, gazing out the microscopic porthole that acted as their window. I think we've made it to Baron, Harley muttered. She reached into her pocket, retrieving a silver pocket watch, and clicked it open. It's nearly ten in the evening. Hardly a civilized hour to conduct any business. And I don't see King Yang's ship. They must have encountered a delay after all. In fact, I think we're the only ship in the harbor. Edward stared silently at his hands, his lips pressed together. Every day, no, every hour, that the dreaded moon hung in the sky, the greater the dread he felt pressing upon his spine. We should try to see Cecil tonight, Edward said, and Harley turned away from the porthole, her eyebrows knitted together. Are you serious, your highness? Won't that exacerbate the delicate situation we seem to be in? Edward shook his head, swinging his legs over the side of the bed. His eyes had turned to flint, and they were focused intensely on the floorboards beneath his boots. I think the delicateness of this situation is precisely why we should skirt protocol just this once, don't you think? Cecil will understand. Harley pressed her lips together as she watched Edward exit the berth. Inside, she could feel the screams of protest rising against her throat, but she couldn't bring herself to argue with him. Normally, it would have been her job to do so, and she would have accepted the task gladly, but something about the cold, distant look his eyes took on when he said Cecil's name made her think better of it. Maybe he was already stealing himself for the worst instead of approaching the crisis with his usual naive optimism. What exactly happened to you while I was out of commission, my lord? Harley reached the surface of the ship just in time to catch the tail end of Edward's orders to the Royal Guard, all of whom had either been awoken from a nap of their own or had never gone to sleep, their weary, swollen eyed stares could have indicated either scenario. And if we don't return within the hour, please present yourselves to Castle Baron. If we don't return? Harley blinked. What is this madness? Edward nodded toward her in acknowledgement of her arrival. Harley, you and I will go ahead to the castle first. I think it will give the wrong impression if we approach with a guard. Grasped in his hand was the bouquet for Cecil, which had bloomed exquisitely since they had left the flower beds of Damsion, you could have hardly timed it more perfectly to present as a gift. Um. For once, Harley didn't know what to say. All she could do was nod. Be careful, your highness, and Harley, Toby bowed. We'll wait here for now. Edward and Harley clambered down the gangplank to the docks, where some of the sailors who had accompanied them were hauling the freight Edward had heard crashing outside. Others were chatting up a small smattering of merchants that were still packing up their stands for the close of business, shiftily glancing around them every few moments as they talked. There were no signs of any of Baron's soldiers, which seemed a little unusual, for a military state like Baron, they certainly had enough of them to protect all the entrances to their kingdom, even a little trade harbor. There was still the possibility of sea monsters shambling their way to shore, after all, Edward could have sworn that he had at a minimum encountered Red Wing cadets who were stuck with the graveyard guard shifts in times past. I know it's late, but the mood seems more somber than usual, Harley remarked. Maybe business hasn't been good. Perhaps, Edward nodded, and she let the subject drop. After a short walk through the meadow that connected the harbor to Baron proper, Edward and Harley approached the castle gates, where two soldiers were awaiting them. Both dressed in violet armor, they appeared to be dragoons, Edward had the arbitrary realization that he didn't know who had actually ever started leading the dragoons in Kane's place when he had disappeared off the face of the planet after the war. Had Cecil taken over in his best friend's role as captain? 
Who goes there? The dragoon on the right questioned, and Harley's cheeks immediately became inflamed, matching the crackling torches that were positioned over each soldier's head in the gateway. How rude of you! You fail to recognize King Edward, ruler of Damsion. The two soldiers looked at each other dumbly. What? Harley snorted in disbelief, and Edward cleared his throat, discreetly resting his hand at her elbow. Looming above and in front of them, nearly every window in the castle was still ablaze with light, someone was still up and about, at least that much was certain. I am here to see King Cecil. May we pass? We wish to speak with His Majesty personally to discuss the reply we received from his messenger, Harley added, wrestling her elbow away from Edward's cold fingers with a subtle twist. The soldiers looked each other again, but much to the visiting party's surprise, merely shrugged. Very well. You may proceed. They turned, pulling open the towering wooden doors that were behind them, leaving just enough space for Edward and Harley to slip through single file. Edward glanced back at Harley before stepping inside, and Harley shot the guards one last look of disgust before running after him. Moments after she had crossed the threshold, the door slammed shut behind her, the sound of the wood hurriedly scraping against the stone floors of the keep making the hair on the back of her neck shoot straight up. There's no one here, Edward frowned. Where are all the guards? Maybe changing shifts for the night? Harley whimpered, wondering if the anxious pounding of her heart could be heard when she spoke out loud. She had never been one to get frightened easily, she had just unabashedly tossed herself into a rotting crater days earlier, after all, but something about the very air of the castle itself felt like it was suffocating her. She feared if she kept breathing too hard that she would suck all of the oxygen out of the room and feel her organs start to shut down. Perhaps we should just make our way to the throne room so that we don't get caught in any perceived compromising situations. Crossing through one empty chamber after the next, at last, they finally reached the antechamber, where they were greeted by yet two more guards seemingly identical to the ones outside, but not one single castle resident. In the brighter light, Edward could see that there were heavy shadows under both men's eyes, only barely concealed by the sloping hood of their helmets that otherwise made them indistinguishable from each other. Wordlessly, they parted, each grasping a golden handle on the throne room doors and pulling them open. Before they entered, Edward turned to Harley, holding out the bouquet. Wordlessly, she tucked the flowers against her chest, and followed him inside. Leaning into the throne at the top of a short flight of stairs, his slender jawline pressed into the palm of his hand, was Cecil. His silver-white hair fell down his shoulders in glossy waves, deep blue amazonite and pearl beads braided in his locks in place of a crown. His pale pink lips curled into a smile as his narrowed eyes fell over the visitors. Sitting up a few inches, Cecil crossed one leg over the other and extended his index finger along the curve of his cheek. It has been long since we last met, Cecil, Edward offered hopefully, having banished the chilled, calculated tone he had carried since they had left the ship. Cecil smiled brilliantly, his right canine gleaming in the muted candlelight, although Harley couldn't help but feel like she was watching a predator size up his prey and not the reunion of two dear friends. It certainly has, Edward. Quite a long time indeed. His voice lacked any warmth or familiarity, and Harley saw his eyes flash as they fell upon her next, as if he didn't quite like what he saw. Trying her best to cordially avoid his stare, she watched helplessly as Edward's face crumpled in confusion. Finally, Cecil cut his glance back to Edward, arching his brow. Is something bothering you, Edward? You can take it easy here, you know. I... I appreciate your kindness, Edward stuttered, and Harley had to restrain herself from both shooting Cecil a dirty look and stomping on Edward's foot to remind him that he was Cecil's equal in every way, despite what his severe lack of confidence indicated otherwise. Completely oblivious to Harley's growing rage, Cecil tapped his finger gently to his temple. The beads in his hair chimed airily like the tune in a music box. Come now, Edward. To what do I owe the honor of a visit from the King of Damsion? Grateful to have made it relatively unscathed through their awkward reintroduction, Edward cleared his throat and raised his chin, much to Harley's relief. I have come to speak of the meteor. Cecil nodded thoughtfully. If that is why you are here, then the answer is the same as the one my emissary gave you. You have nothing to worry about. Please let Baron handle the matter. Edward pressed a hand to his hip. And why should Baron handle it? That's right. Harley smiled gently. You've got this, my lord. Do we have a trust issue here, Edward? Cecil purred dangerously, and Harley's face fell. Damnation. Edward shook his head quickly. Of course not. 
Superb, Cecil nodded, shifting in his throne so that now his right leg crossed over his left. I'm so glad you understand, Edward. I knew I could count on that. Edward bit down on his lip, taking a slow, tempered breath. Since when did Cecil Harvey use pretentious words like superb in his vocabulary? It was like he was speaking an entirely different language. Cecil's gaze flicked between Harley and Edward once again, and Harley couldn't help but inch closer to Edward's side. Edward had also noticed that Cecil still hadn't actually acknowledged Harley's existence, which was even more bizarre. It wasn't like they were strangers, Harley had been a part of Edward's life for almost as long as he had known Cecil. Something the matter. Cecil breathed, and Harley could feel Edward jump. W. What are your thoughts on that moon, Cecil? Cecil tilted his head. What do you think about it? Edward swallowed nervously. I believe it portends ill times ahead for all of us. It reminds me too much of the past events that still haunt us to this day. Hmm, Cecil frowned, looking away. All the more reason, then, that I hope you will allow us to handle the matters concerning the fallen meteor. I see. Edward looked down. So you think the two are related? Baron has a mandate to govern over this land, to keep it at peace, Cecil drawled, twisting a lock of hair around his finger bemusedly. I almost feel a personal responsibility for the moon, you understand? If it is the Lunarians making their return, well, I can't very well just turn my back to it all, can I? I suppose I'm the only one who can actually do anything about it, in that case. Edward had to grind his teeth to keep his jaw from hitting the floor. No. You're not alone Cecil, you never were. What about Rosa, Rydia, Edge, and Kane? What about Harley and I? But instead, he merely nodded, and Harley stared at the floor, devastated at what she was hearing. She had anticipated some friction, but nothing like this, this was beyond even the worst-case scenario she had neatly mapped out in her mind. Had Cecil really lost faith in those who had fought beside him during the First War? Why take everything on himself? Finally, Edward gave a short bow. Of course. But if you ever need to consult with me, please do not hesitate to do so. Cecil tilted his chin slightly, his eyes never leaving Edward's, Harley had never seen such a cold, depthless stare, Cecil's eyes had transformed into black holes, where light went to die. Thank you so much for taking the long journey to my domain, Edward. So, that's it. We're dismissed. Edward clenched his fists. If you will excuse me, then... Harley pretended to fall in step with him, leaning in and pressing her lips to his ear hurriedly as she held up the bouquet as a shield. Your Highness, is this really just up to Cecil to decide? Edward blinked, his eyes meeting Harley's briefly before he whirled back around to face Cecil. Ah, one more thing. I could not help but notice that Queen Rosa is not with us today. Cecil frowned. Yes. She's not feeling very well, I'm afraid. Is that so? That is troubling news. Cecil shrugged. There's no need for alarm. It is nothing life-threatening. Edward decided to press his luck a bit more. Is Prince Theodore doing well? Absolutely, Cecil flashed another smile. He is out of the castle for training right now. That is good to hear, Edward replied softly. My wife and I would expect nothing less from our son, after all, Cecil uttered, shaking his head with a grin as if to say kids, right. Now then, I wish you a safe and pleasant journey home. Yes, my lord, Edward nodded, and Harley looked away, folding her hands together over the stems of the bouquet. She was afraid if she looked at Cecil's condescending smirk one last time that she would launch herself across the throne and smack it off his pretty face with her whip. As they started to walk away, Cecil suddenly leapt up from the throne, laughing to himself as if someone had just shared a hilarious joke. Ah, I just remembered. Guards, please present King Edward with the gift we discussed. Yes, sir. Two voices exclaimed from behind Edward and Harley, causing her to nearly scream in shock. A pair of soldiers emerged from the sweeping curtains that had been tied back over the panoramic window that made up the rear wall of the throne room, and Harley's hand flew to her chest. Had they been being watched the entire time? From the king, your majesty, one of the soldiers offered, handing Edward a gunmetal gray, hinged box that fit snugly in the palm of his hand. Carved in the lid of the box was the Baronian crest. What is this, my lord? 
Edward asked confusedly, turning the box over in his fingers. A small swing enclosure in the front kept it sealed tight. A token of our friendship, and of my appreciation for your visit. Please, accept it. Cecil approached Edward, closing his hands over the box in Edward's hand and emphatically pressing it into Edward's chest. Edward looked up at him apprehensively, shivering from the chill of his fingers. I appreciate your kindness. In that case, I have also brought a souvenir from Damsion. He nodded toward Harley, who blinked, forgetting about the flowers in her hands. Cecil watched her expectantly, and she flushed as she clumsily handed them over. Cecil pressed his nose to the blossoms, inhaling deeply. Such beautiful flowers! How befitting of you, if I may say so, Edward! Cecil handed them off to the waiting guard, who plopped them without ceremony into an ornamental vase that was sitting empty in the back of the room. With Rosa sick, the throne room has been lacking fresh flowers from our rose garden, so this is perfect timing. Say something, Cecil. Say that you remember. Edward watched the flowers gently flop forward within the vase in a heap, the guard had not bothered putting them in a vessel that was an appropriate size. Cecil glanced back at the vase and then looked to Edward, crossing his arms over his chest. Is something the matter? Oh, nothing. I am glad you like them. Edward shrugged, taking a cue from Cecil and offering a bright smile of his own. Taking Harley's arm, he raised a hand in departure. Cecil raised his as well. Until we meet again, Edward. Certainly. Do take care. Harley let Edward escort her out of the throne room. As the doors slammed behind them, Harley let out a low hiss. Your Highness. What is the meaning of this? We're going home, Edward answered her whisper in a normal tone through his teeth, and he tried rolling his eyes back toward the throne room doors to indicate that they still could have been under observation. Your Highness. Harley frowned, and Edward tugged her forward. Let's go. They quickly made their exit from the cast, once again only seeing the same guards that had greeted them at the gates. It was only when they had returned to the ship that either of them spoke aloud once again. The captain was waiting near the steering wheel, stifling a yawn, and Amy, Toby, and Joe were leaning against a pile of empty crates, fast asleep and using each other's heads for pillows. Well, that was certainly quick. The captain guffawed. I told your companions that I'd wake them when the hour passed, but I guess there's no need now. We're ready to go when you are, no other passengers tonight except you five, and all of the cargo has been unloaded. Shall we shove off? Yes, please, Edward sighed. But may I make a small request? What's that? The captain asked, and Harley looked at Edward in surprise. If you have no other business in Capo, would you be willing to take as far as the northeastern coast of Damsion, near Mount Hobbs? We're all exhausted and Harley is still recovering from desert fever, the thought of making the journey home through the underground waterway does not appeal to me after the night we've had. Er, of course your highness, the captain blinked. We'll try to get you as close as we can without a proper dock. If the winds are good tonight, we'll most likely reach Damsion in the morning. My lord, please don't ask this just on my account, Harley blushed, but Edward shook his head. I won't hear any arguments, Harley. Meet me in the berth for a debrief, all right. With that, Edward turned and disappeared down the stairwell that took them below deck. Err? All right, Harley blinked, glancing back at the captain apologetically. Thank you for your trouble. It's nothing, Lady Harley, the captain smiled. It does sound like you've had a long day. I suggest you get some rest, we'll try to make it as smooth sailing for you as we can. A few minutes later, Harley drifted downstairs, finding Edward exactly where he had said he would be, back in the berth they had been napping in earlier. She could hear the sailors above on the deck shouting orders at each other as the ship pulled away from the docks, and watched wordlessly as their minimal view in the porthole changed from the barren harbor to endless blue. Edward looked up at Harley, hunched over in the bed with his arms between his knees. Gone was the noble lord who had marched fearlessly into Baron, replaced by a defeated wisp of a man. Harley rested her hand on her hip. Your Highness, what was the meaning of your behavior in front of King Cecil? Why were you acting so? She bit her lip, looking for the right, and least offensive, descriptor. Compliant. Edward laughed softly. You don't have to spare your words, Harley, I need the truth from you more so than anyone else. However, that person was not Cecil. Harley nearly choked. What? 
she kicked her foot back so that it knocked into the door, slamming it shut. My lord, what are you saying? The real Cecil would have known what my gift really was, Edward frowned. But... He didn't say a thing. What do you mean? I mean this, Edward reached inside his vest, retrieving a single white flower. You had asked me, back in the waterway, if I had ever assisted Cecil with my harp. Well, there was one time where I was actually useful to my friends, the only time. It was when I was laid up in Troya, Cecil, Tella, Sid, and Yang had come to the kingdom in attempt to retrieve the stolen crystal of earth from the Dark Elf, and we were briefly reunited. I had troubling rumors that the Dark Elf protected himself with an amplified magnetic field that rendered armor and swords useless in battle, which would put Cecil at a terrible disadvantage. I was so weak that I couldn't even get out of bed, so I did the only thing I could for him at that time, I sent him to fight the Dark Elf with a blade of Whisperweed. Edward held out the flower, twirling it in his fingers. Through it, I was able to transmit the sound of my harp and play a song that disrupted the Dark Elf's concentration, it broke his control over the magnetic field, and Cecil was able to slay him and save the crystal. Your Highness. Harley shook her head. So you think, because King Cecil didn't recognize the Whisperweed, he... Suddenly, a female voice filled the room, and Edward pressed his finger to his lips to shush Harley. The flower in his hand was faintly glowing, pulsating with each clipped syllable that hung in the air. Are you sure that was wise? The voices are coming from the flower. Harley squealed, and Edward nodded, holding up his finger once more. Next came a new voice, male, and very familiar. There is nothing to worry about. Though he was acting extremely suspicious of me. It appears that he came here personally just to check up on matters. Weaker creatures need to be more cautious. Harley clasped her hand to her mouth. That's Cecil. But the female voice. It doesn't sound like Queen Rosa at all. It's too deep and remote. Like she's reading lines from a dictionary. Damn Sion is a hub of commerce, not of war. Its military is no more than mere ceremony. Seizing it would be a simple matter. I see. So the fire crystal... ...is ours any time we wish to take it. Overconfidence is ill-advised. It is not overconfidence. My plan is already underway. Harley whispered against her palm. Plan? To steal our crystal? Edward sighed, lowering the flower on the bed next to him. It had gone silent and stopped glowing, whoever Cecil had been talking to was gone, or the conversation was over. The gift Cecil gave us. You must be curious about it. Oh, yes, of course, Harley nodded. He seemed excited to give it to you. Edward held out the metal box, shaking his head. Well, I must disappoint you, for this box can never be opened. Harley frowned. Are you already aware of its contents, Your Highness? Edward sighed. If my hunch is correct, then it contains a carnelian signet. It is the very item behind the tragedy that once befell Mist, by Cecil's unknowing hand. Your Highness. Harley swallowed the lump that had formed in her throat. If it's that dangerous, shouldn't we toss it into the ocean right now? And... What are we going to do if Baron really comes for our crystal? Why does Cecil want it in the first place? She didn't want to say it out loud, but Cecil's disembodied voice had been right, Damn Sion had never been rebuilt with war in mind, there was no way they could defend themselves against even a fraction of Baron's military. If she were being really honest, King Cecil himself could probably just stroll up to the front door and take out half of their guard on his own. But before Edward could reply, they heard a shout from above. Captain! Up ahead! Whoa! What's that? Harley threw open the door, bolting up the stairs with Edward in close pursuit. When they reached the deck, they saw a gathering of sailors at the bow of the ship, all staring at a massive whirlpool that had erupted in the middle of their route. The ship had already started turning to get out of its way, but before the vessel could be righted, the whirlpool became suffused with a myriad of bubbles, and vanished before their eyes, like nothing had happened. My lord! Harley gasped. Did... Did Yang's ship run into one of those? Edward whispered. How did it appear and disappear so suddenly? We've heard rumors of these random maelstroms just popping up out of the blue as of late, but this is the first time I've seen one, the captain frowned. Let us pray we don't run into any more on our way home. 
Edward lowered his head, feeling a familiar, but threatening, chill trickle down his spine. It had been seventeen years, but he had never forgotten the dread that had seeped into his very marrow right before their ship had been attacked, before Rydia had been swallowed by a sea god and aged seemingly overnight into a young woman thanks to the twisted time flow of the Feymarch, before Cecil had thrown himself over Edward's flailing form in an attempt to keep him from being torn away from their ship. Edward could never remember what happened after that, something heavy had crashed into him and shattered his body, and when he had next opened his eyes, Cecil was long gone, and he was waiting to die on a beach in Troya. Leviathan Has something happened to you and Rydia? Edward was so exhausted that he had begun seeing things as they finally emerged from the ship onto the white, fine sanded beaches of Damsion's northeastern shore, a short distance away from the meteor impact site and the ant lion cave. Only half awake thanks to a night of shallow, nightmare ridden sleep, he took the last of the gold that was in his pockets and handed it all to the captain, who espoused his thanks over and over until Edward had walked far enough down the gangplank that he could no longer make out the captain's voice. In the far distance, he could swear that he saw a group of soldiers approaching, but that would have been nigh impossible. None of his troops ever surveyed the northeast shores, and certainly no one would have been expecting him to return by ship to this particular location, since he had convinced the captain to go off-route. He glanced over at Harley, jealously taking in her sleeping form as she lay slumped over Toby's shoulders. They had all tried awakening her when they had arrived to no avail, so Toby had decided it was just easier to carry her out like a sack of flour. But the further they got from the ship, the closer yet the mirage of soldiers came, and Edward was shook when he heard one of them very clearly shout his name. King Edward Amy, Toby, and Joe had heard it too, and even Harley stirred slightly, so it wasn't the mirage after all. What in the world is our guard doing out here? Amy asked under her breath. Your Highness, please stay vigilant. Isn't that my line? Edward asked drowsily, but Amy didn't laugh. A few minutes later the soldiers had caught up to them, exchanging salutes with Edward's guard. Thank goodness we found you, Your Highness, one of them said. The Chancellor wanted us to find you as soon as possible, we had just come back from searching the Ant Lion Cave when we spotted the ship. Some children at the castle had tipped us off that you had been heading in that direction. Ah, so Mariah and Reed figured out who Chris was after all. I suppose it was only a matter of time. Edward crossed his arms impatiently. If the Chancellor ended up catching any kind of hint that Harley had been in danger, Edward would never hear the end of it, was that what this was about? Or, gods forbid, had Baron already made their move for the Crystal of Fire? The Chancellor knew where I was and we'd made it home in due time. There may have been a slight delay, but... I apologize for our intrusion, my lord, but his orders were to bring you home as soon as we found you. Some guests were brought to the castle and they have apparently shared with the Chancellor distressing news that he wishes you to know right away. That snapped Edward out of his sleepy stupor. Guests? From where? And did you say brought? The soldiers shook their head. The Chancellor would tell us no more than he felt we needed to know, I'm so sorry, my lord. It sounded very sensitive. Please, if you would come with us. Yes, yes, right away, Edward sighed. Please, lead us. Crossing west toward the castle, Edward tried to push away every negative anticipation that bubbled to the surface of his brain, but after what he had seen both in Baron and on the seas returning home, he could only allow himself the luxury of terror for whatever was surely coming next. As soon as they had set foot on the castle steps, another guard rushed out to meet them, and this time the excitement finally woke up Harley. Hmm. She blinked a few times, instantly blushing when she felt Toby's arm positioned right beneath her bottom to keep her hoisted in the air. Arr. I'm quite awake now, thank you. Your Highness. Harley. Please, right this way, the Chancellor is in the throne room. Amy, Toby, Joe, you are dismissed for now. The guard saluted them, and they all gave a salute back. Have a good day, Toby said, setting Harley down as if she were a glass figurine. She flushed and turned away, looking up at Edward. Wordlessly, he took her wrist and pulled her forward, running so fast that she otherwise wouldn't have been able to keep up on her own. The throne room doors were tightly shut, which was not standard protocol, whenever Edward did not have a need for privacy, he liked for the doors to be open so that the castle residents never felt like they were excluded from any particular parts of the castle, it was their home too, after all. Harley tugged the doors open, and they stepped inside, 
both surprised to not only see every chandelier in the room lit ablaze, but also the fireplace that they so rarely used, since the climate was usually far too warm for it to serve any real purpose other than atmospheric. Two figures stood next to the fire, one of them a woman who wrapped in layers of blankets with tangles of wet hair, had lowered and delicate hands clutching the fabric so tightly that her knuckles were a pale, glossy white in the flickering light of the flames. Next to her stood a stout man, his back turned to the entryway as he kept one arm wrapped around his shivering companion, the other waving wildly in the air as he relayed something neither Edward nor Harley could hear to the Chancellor, who was standing with his back to the wall. As soon as the Chancellor laid eyes on Edward and Harley, he jumped up, shouting in excitement as their two guests turned to see who had entered. Oh my gods, Edward gasped, and Harley pressed her hands to her mouth in shock, only able to emit a high-pitched squeak. What in the world are you doing here? End of chapter